Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Michelle Yee from Emergency Medicine Cases, and this is the rapid review of episode 68, Emergency Management of Sickle Cell Disease. So you walk into the room and find your sickle cell patient texting and chatting minutes after complaining of 9 out of 10 pain. After you've given your fourth dose of hydromorphone, you can't help but think, is this patient malingering? The reality is the majority of sickle cell patients suffer real pain, but they may not look uncomfortable and actually may appear calm. Many of these individuals have learned to adapt to a lifetime of chronic pain and use things like their phones to keep themselves distracted. The rates of true opioid addiction in sickle cell patients is very low, and literature suggests that we as emergency providers under-treat pain. Sickle cell disease has been described in all races, including light skin color. So unless there's clear evidence that they don't have sickle cell disease, take their complaint seriously and use analgesia aggressively. So let's start off this rapid review by highlighting a couple key clinical pearls. One, be sure to ask, is this their usual pain? If the pain is different from previous pain crises, broaden your differential diagnosis and include not only all the painful conditions we consider in all emergency patients, but also the sickle cell specific ones like acute chest syndrome. The diagnosis of pain crisis is a diagnosis of exclusion. And the diagnosis is also a clinical one. No laboratory test will reliably tell you whether the patient is suffering from a pain crisis. And if you get blood work, A normal hemoglobin level does not rule out a sickle cell pain crisis. Patients with a higher baseline serum hemoglobin are actually more likely to suffer pain episodes due to vaso-occlusion. In the next few minutes, we're going to go over the approach to the history, physical, investigations, and management for the sickle cell patient. So, let's get started. On history, you want to ask these patients what sickle cell complications have they had in the past? How often do they have pain or come to the emergency department? Are they currently taking pain medications, antibiotics, hydroxyurea? What's their baseline hemoglobin level, and have they ever required blood transfusions? The goal of the physical exam is to rule out sickle cell complications. So examine the joints and the soft tissues, looking for evidence of cellulitis, septic joints, osteomyelitis. Do a good respiratory exam, looking for evidence of acute chest syndrome. And if you have concern for splenic sequestration, look for hepatosplenomegaly. One of the most important pearls is to look at the vitals. Sickle cell patients presenting with an uncomplicated pain crisis will often have normal vital signs. Any abnormal vital signs should raise the suspicion for an alternative diagnosis. And fever needs to be taken very seriously. Recall, these patients are functionally asplenic. Therefore, they're at increased risk for bacterial infection, especially with encapsulated organisms. In sickle cell disease patients with fever, have a very low threshold to do a septic workup and start empiric antibiotics. If they're febrile patients without an identified source, consider admission. Now that we have an approach, let's review the investigations, or the lack thereof. Our experts recommend lab tests are generally not required. In uncomplicated sickle cell crises, blood work really isn't going to tell you anything you don't already know. But... Blood work can be completely reasonable if your patient's being admitted, you suspect another diagnosis, they're septic, look systemically unwell, or you're suspecting worsening anemia or jaundice. In those types of cases, consider doing CBC, reticulocyte count, LFTs, bilirubin, LDH, electrolytes. And as always, look at your entire clinical picture and consider any other investigations or imaging as indicated. Note. If you have a patient with a sudden drop in their hemoglobin, this is where the reticulocyte count can really help distinguish a sequestration crisis from an aplastic crisis. That is, if you have a low retic count, you're thinking diminished RBC production, which can occur in aplastic crisis, for example, with parvovirus. Meanwhile, a high retic count may indicate splenic enlargement with sequestration to the lungs, spleen, or liver. Next, let's talk about management. For pain management, These patients often come in having already exhausted their home options, so ED pain management is often done with high-dose IV opioids in a rapid, effective, sustained fashion. So what does that mean? 
Similar to your renal colic patients, you can give hydromorphone 1 to 2 milligrams or morphine 6 to 12 milligrams every 15 to 30 minutes until pain is under control. We're targeting approximately a 2 out of 10 point decrease in pain score, and if their pain is still not under control, try escalating the dose by 25%. A general rule of thumb for initial dosing of opioids is to administer the patient's usual total daily short-acting dose in a single IV dose, then frequently reassess. You can use a continuous infusion if required, and if there's no IV route available, generally sub-Q is more reliable than IM. Consider a multimodal approach as an adjunct to opioids with Tylenol, NSAIDs, and ketamine. But avoid long-term treatment with NSAIDs in sickle cell patients as they're already at increased risk for chronic renal failure. Note that sicklers usually have a low creatinine, so a normal or a high creatinine may indicate moderate to severe renal dysfunction. If you're not getting anywhere with large-dose opioids, consider trying 20 mg of IV ketamine over 2-5 to five minutes, repeating as necessary every 30 minutes. And while steroids has been shown to reduce pain scores and length of stay, they're actually associated with high rates of pain recurrence and not recommended by our experts. Now, how about supportive management like oxygen or fluids? Bottom line, not really needed unless if patients are hypoxic or hypovolemic. So if O2 is greater than 92%, no supplemental oxygen is needed. Supplemental O2 is actually thought to cause myelosuppression and increased transfusion requirements, so only use it if needed. Fluids should only be given to those who are overtly hypovolemic, like in sepsis or people having diarrheal illness or vomiting. Overhydration can cause atelectasis, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, and pulmonary edema. So if you're going to give fluids, only resuscitate to euvolemia. And for maintenance fluids, use a hypotonic solution like half-normal saline or D5 half-normal. And with other treatments like transfusions or hydroxyurea, while red blood cell transfusions can be life-saving in situations like an acute chest syndrome, in your uncomplicated pain crises, there is absolutely no role. Transfusions can increase the risk of alloimmunization and increase pain, and this occurs because it increases the viscosity of the blood, leading to vasoocclusion, precipitating things like acute chest syndrome and stroke. So any decision to transfuse should really be done in consultation with a transfusion specialist or hematologist. Oral hydroxyurea actually can be really helpful in patients with frequent pain episodes. Hydroxyurea increases the production of fetal hemoglobin, thereby decreasing the amount of sickled hemoglobin, and it's been shown to decrease the frequency of pain episodes, acute chest crises, and the number of transfusions. So if you identify a frequent flyer who may benefit from hydroxyurea, refer accordingly. So let's conclude with the recap of the key points. One. Sickle cell pain crisis is a diagnosis of exclusion, and the differential needs to be kept wide, especially for bacterial infection and complications related to sickle cell disease. Due to adaptation and distraction techniques, sickle cell patients may appear comfortable, yet still require aggressive analgesia, and it can occur in all races. Most patients with a sickle cell pain crisis will not exhibit abnormal vital signs, so if you see some, you need to watch out, especially if there's fever. In the uncomplicated sickle cell patient, lab tests generally aren't going to be required. Also, supplemental O2 and fluids aren't generally needed. Reserve these for patients who are clearly hypoxic or hypovolemic, because they can actually worsen outcomes. Take a multimodal analgesia approach with only short courses of NSAIDs. Steroids and red blood cell transfusions should generally be avoided. And if patients are having frequent pain episodes and aren't on hydroxyurea, consider referring them accordingly. So that's a wrap. For more information on complications such as a plastic crisis, acute chest syndrome, stroke, and eye trauma in sickle cell disease, visit the EM Cases website for the written summary.